Hello. Please let me see your ticket stubs for the double-edged double bill. In case you weren't aware, Keanu Reeves is a Dracula of Tai Chi. Whoa. <gasps> Each week, Adam Thomas and Thomas Mariani will come to the table to discuss the randomly selected yin and yang of a double feature. Then, both will have to pick a number between 1 and 10 in order to seal their fates for the next episode. One has two good movies, the other two bad. Let the chaos begin, dudes. I am Adam S. Thomas Esquire. And I am Thomas Theodore Mariani. And, and we, we are, are Double, double Edge Double, double Bill. Bill. That was a most triumphant intro, Adam, but I must say, we need a most non-heinous guest to help us with our Keanu report. You got anybody? Yeah. My, uh, my, well, my wife. My wife is here. <laughs> <laughs> she, she's our excellent guest, Heather Thomas. Whoa. Hat trick. Trying to do my best Neo impression. So are you just out there doing kung fu? <laughs> <laughs> she's out in the front room just throwing kicks. <laughs> I'm just staring. Very good. Um, and welcome back. Obviously, as Adam mentioned, you've been on two previous times. So this is your hat trick. And uh, we invited you back on and we wanted to know why exactly Keanu of all the topics we gave. Um, because I had a huge, well, still do, had a huge crush on Keanu growing up. In fact, my uh, my email that's still the exact same from when it was my aim <laughs> the last letter in is it a K for Keanu Reeves because he's going to be with me forever. <laughs> I mean, that's possible. I think he is an immortal. Oh yeah, he's gonna be he's gonna be alive way after I'm gone. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you got to figure as long as he's alive next week, he's gonna outlive me. <laughs> and I mean, if, to be fair, he does have that beard. Maybe if he shaved that, he would appear far older. There's a Benjamin Button thing with the beard. Maybe. Maybe. Who knows. We're doing Keanu Reeves in honor of John Wick, Chapter 3. And many people obviously dismiss him when he originally came out of the scene, like the mid to late 80s. Kind of dismissed him, and some still do to this day, as sort of a dumbass to some degree. Like a surfer bro, kind of like, whatever, dude, I just go with the flow kind of guy. But I, I think as I've grown older, I've realized that the issue isn't so much that he's, like, an idiot as much as Keanu is completely confident and relaxed. Yeah, and his voice, he's he cannot do anything to get rid of that inflection in his voice. No matter we'll what. Talk about, we'll talk yeah. about what there's a problem <laughs> with that in a bit. Um, because we are talking about, because of Keanu and John Wick Chapter 3, we're talking about our good pick is The Man of Tai Chi, uh, which is a movie he both appears in and directed, his directorial debut. And then our bad feature is Bram Stoker's Dracula, which... We may not necessarily think it's a bad movie, but isn't the best representation of Keanu himself. Yeah, I'd say that's very uh, apt. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but what's your relationship with Keanu, Adam? I've always kind of been a fan of Keanu Reeves. I mean, even as far back as, like, I Love You to Death and Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure and uh, Parenthood. And, I mean, he's point break. I mean, come on, man. I mean, the guy's, he's at, he is most excellent. But he really is. He's awesome. I mean, and you never hear a bad story about the guy. He's a real good guy. And he knows exactly what he is. He knows what he's into. And he does what he likes to do. And, I mean, just for that, I give him credit. Because he could easily be like a Nicolas Cage or a Travolta or anything. Bruce Willis even now. Where they just take anything that's thrown it at them. And he doesn't. Well, right. And it seems like he also has a genuine passion for film. Because, I mean, he did mm -hmm. that, like, side by side documentary. He was in it, at least. He was, like, the host of it. We're talking about digital versus film. And I hear he also is a big cinephile. And as you mentioned, any story I hear about that guy is, like, he's the most amazing person ever. Like, I, I love there's a story where apparently this woman who was going to her first audition was in ratty clothes, like, her car broke down. And Keanu decided to help her out on the side. Didn't know anything about her. And pushed her car all the way to the mechanic. And that woman was Academy Award winner Octavia Spencer. Oh, that's awesome. Wow. <laughs> she, she told that story a lot, and she apparently goes to 
every one of his movies opening weekend. Because... Yeah, dude. Like I heard about, uh, you know, the people sitting on the plane next to him and he enjoyed talking to him so much. He reimbursed them for their tickets. I mean, just that type of shit. Where even like he gave all the um, stunt work team in the Matrix, like he paid them out of pocket and gave them a raise. Well, and of course he had such an affection for the stunt people in those movies that they would later go on to make John Wick. And he also has such a respect for stunt people. Like he always says, "I don't do my own stunts. I do my action acting." Right. And stunt people do all the real work. Oh, which absolutely. I think is, it's very noble for him to say. Uh, but anyway, th- we were talking about stunt work. Let's go ahead and get into our first film, which relies heavily on a lot of stunt work, Man of Tai Chi. How would you like to test how good you are, Tiger? Or could become? What if I lose? I can't fight Tai Chi for mine. It's disarmable. Kill or be killed, Tiger. <laughs> That's what I want. I didn't come here to kill. You owe me a life. And so uh, Man of Tai Chi uh, came out in November of 2013, and as I mentioned, it was Keanu Reeves' directorial debut, and as of yet, the only film he's directed. And basically, it's the story um, that takes place mostly in China, in which we have our lead, uh, Tiger, as played by Tiger Chin, who was a real stunt person. I love that that's his real name, too. It's pretty dope, yes. Um, and he plays our lead, who's basically like this delivery guy, who also has an interest in Tai Chi, which is more of like a meditation thing than it is a martial art. But he is tr- starting to develop it into a martial art he can fight with to the displeasure of his master. And uh, he is recruited to be part of a fighting ring, an underground illegal fighting ring, ring um which is hosted by keanu reeves as basically like an american bond villain in the middle of china pretty much pretty yeah. much um and things start to turn a bit deadly as uh, tiger moves up the ranks and also has a plot in which he has to literally pretty much save the rec center but with the temple that his master owns <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not too far off from breaking uh this yeah. is unofficially breaking <laughs> three this, that's what it's this like... is yeah, it's Ski Patrol in China. <laughs> Basically. Um, and Adam, this was your pick, though you said you hadn't seen it before. Uh, though yeah. we, I'd, I'd heard of this one, too. Because obviously, oh, Ken Reeves directing, and here's how that went. And how did you think that went? Uh, I mean, look, I'm a sucker for martial arts movies. I love good action kung fu movies. And this is, to me, this is it's a perfectly fine made kung fu movie. And for his directorial debut, I... There, there wasn't really much that I noticed in it as far as direction and or shots or anything like that, that I was like, oh, you can tell this is a novice. Um, so, I mean, I guess he did a pretty good job. Yeah. <laughs> Ring endorsement. Love that. Uh, but what about you, Heather? What did you think of Man of Tai Chi? I, I agree in the aspect of, uh, like, you know, just how the storyline went. I thought it was just a pretty generic kind of, you know, what we, what you would have for a Kung Fu movie. But I actually have to say you can tell in terms of his directing, it was, it was kind of like a fresh face, you know, even to the point that the camera's swinging around at, uh, like, different times and – or the one – the one bit where it showed time passing where it's like literally you see the skyscape of China and then the moon's going and the sun comes up and it pans right that into Tiger's room. Like you could tell that he was just trying. There was bits and pieces you could even see from other movies that he liked, like when they pan in through the window that he must have, like you said before, his respect for cinema, you could tell he was trying to filtrate it into the movie um and i thought that's cool because you're seeing somebody that just really likes what they're doing and they're trying to show it off and they finally got their hands on the reins but in terms of i mean the fight scenes were really good there was some uh, weirdly placed wiring effects and there was some weirdly placed fighting scenes as to what direction you were supposed to be watching but you could tell he was really passionate about it, and that brings you right into the movie. Like, you're just like, all right, I'll follow him. Even though his acting wasn't the greatest, you're like, he's into it, I'm into it too, kind of deal. <laughs> I guess I generally agree. I think I'm a bit more enthusiastic, because admittingly, Adam and I have talked about this, we really want to do a kung fu or martial arts-themed episode in general at some point in the future, because it's not a big forte of mine. It's always been a blind spot, a lot of especially like the... Um, sort of classic kung fu movies or a lot of stuff with like um, Bruce Lee or Jackie Chan not as familiar with that stuff so as a bit more of a novice 
I did find this to be fun, um, though I will agree that there are points where you can tell that it's never from a lack of enthusiasm that Keanu directs the movie. It's just that there are points where he seems a bit too big for his britches. Like, especially there's a whole fight scene involving Tiger at this, like, weird Joel Schumacher-inspired club. Just a yeah. lot of, like, yes, weird exactly. angles and overuse of light that was just not that interesting to me. <laughs> and just felt like, okay, you're trying, Keanu, to respect that. But it, it works a lot better when, especially, there's a point when Tiger go- whenever Tiger goes into that one sort of padded cell-looking room... And he just fights somebody there. That works the best because it's kind of plays into Keanu's persona where it's a lot more relaxed, the direction. It's a lot more sort of, let's just stake it still and let these fighters actually fight out. Which, of course, a lot of these people are apparently stunt people or people that worked in fighting rings that um, Tiger Chen himself did in real life. But apparently some of this was inspired by his fighting tournament days in China. And you can tell there's a lot of sort of like real stunt work going on here. There's so many. Like, what would you, what would you say was your favorite fight that happened in this movie? Well, I did like his initial fight, like the interview. I thought it was adequately brutal, but I really did enjoy the uh, the two fights, one with the guy in the tournament and then one with the really big Russian guy, where he just destroyed them, where he just became unhinged and just kicked the living shit out of them. Especially because Tiger Chen is so unassuming looking. Mm-hmm. Like, he doesn't look like he should be able to just rip you apart, but it works. It's like a Tiger Cub Chen. Uh, I see what you did there. Nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> but what thing <laughs> could put the guitar riff in again? I do want to say, though, uh, the wire, as Heather alluded to, the wire work, I'm not a fan of wire work in straight martial arts movies. It doesn't bother me if the movies are more in like the fantastical realm, like Hero or Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, and things like that. But in movies like this, my thing is when they just throw it in in certain areas it, it it almost immediately takes me out of the fight um my thing is you're gonna do it just go full bore with it like even the you know the wind punches that you know the master gave him and then gives Keanu do that the whole movie yeah if you're gonna do it it works better when they they're building up to that because they kind of hint at the whole like oh this one special move you can do just make people fly off um I think if you build up to that and have mostly just like these grounded fights i agree more with that that like if you're gonna do it either do it the whole time or genuinely build up to it there's right. a, i agree the, the few moments of wire work prior to i think especially the final fight with keanu don't quite work uh, yeah. it was definitely more noticeable in the keanu fight there was a couple moves where it's like it just looked sloppy yeah look labor well, but at the same time, I would honestly say that was probably my favorite fight, if nothing else, for one, you, you've you got, I think all the other guys that Tiger Chin fights are, like, solid sort of opponents, but mm-hmm. I love the presence Keanu has as this villain, where he is, it's like I mentioned, he's a fucking Bond villain, where he just is, like, sitting in his elaborate palace, and he's just like, huh, look at these people fight for me. It's It's like the perfect kind of Nicolas Cage style hammy performance I like where it feels hammy but in a way that's a lot more earnest from Keanu and then once he's at that point he's lost everything just comes in and I love every time he says you owe me a life yes <laughs> it's so but he does say it quite a bit quite, it's his catchphrase of the movie if we had the Keanu <laughs> doll from this movie he would say you owe me a life every time you pulled the string it was so funny we were watching it and just how much of a giant Keanu looks like compared to Tiger Chen. And I'm the same height as Keanu Reeves. We're six one. Right. We're not that big, but it was like watching a grow man. Like it was like watching me fight my daughter, like throw <laughs> her around the room, <laughs> which I do. I'm training. <laughs> but it, Heather, it was... you got the, the wire work going on there too. With right. her. <laughs> Just like a elaborate pulley system. <laughs> But it's like old shitty jump ropes. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I did like the Keanu scene I, simply because it's like you do by the end of this movie really want to see him fight. Mm-hmm. Like you want to see that fight happen. And they he's owed a life, Adam. Of course you want he's that. Owed a life. <laughs> you owe me a life. <laughs> I okay. think my favorite is between him and his master because I think like it's the one point in the movie where you could tell it was full of like total like subcontext where Tiger's wearing black and his you know his master's wearing white and the difference between Tai Chi and Tai Chi is all about balancing you know um, the different forces like yin and yang and I like the fact that it was like the whole you've seen the power of 
of the master being able to do it in like a meditative state, like he was taking the punches and you can see now Tiger was like, you know, in the angry state. And um, I got to admit, like I got psyched that they did the wind punch. I was like waiting for something like that to happen. And it was like, Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm totally down for like, <laughs> like I wish I would have kept happening. magic. <laughs> when that happens in movies, I'm like, this is the best. This is it. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this, is, this is real. <laughs> I don't understand this culture, therefore this must be real. <laughs> they can all do this, I think. Look, as an ignorant white man, this looks dope <laughs> and totally 100% legit. No, but that's what I'm saying, though. I did like that scene, too. Um, and I, I love, like, you know, the power of Wind Punch. The, the power of his kung fu is so great. I just wish that they would have just grabbed that by the balls and just ran with it the whole movie. Like, have the Tiger character have this, like, he's so good at what he does that he's harnessed other energies or whatever, and everybody else plays it real, but yet he's just, like, this, basically a wizard of kung fu, and that's why he could do the wire tricks and all that. Like I said, it, it the first fight is so grounded in reality, and anytime he's in the tournament, it's very, like, shot like it's real but then that the fucking batman forever club and then the fucking uh keanu fight the the wire work was just so rough and what a criminal misuse of uh eco iowas see i'll disagree with you on that in terms of one not too long after this we had force awakens which is the most criminal use of him and the other guy from the right whose name i forgot ever ever because no, like, you, you yeah. hear holy fuck those two dudes are in a star wars movie and they don't do anything that's a bummer. Um, as opposed to this, what I like especially is that him and Tiger Chin have this interesting interaction where Tiger doesn't want to fight this guy and literally is like, I won't fight you. I won't fight you. He has to like do evasive Over. moves. Over. I, I actually, I dug that idea that like he's doing these evasive moves and using his Tai Chi to get away from doing a fight. That was a more unique twist on the idea. And I felt like it worked for his character in the movie, which is a, a very simplistic character arc where he's a delivery guy and he likes doing Tai Chi, but he also wants to prove himself as a fighter. And as he goes along, he grows this rage that keeps increasing until he sees that, oh, they're manipulating all this for an arc, which I love that bit, actually, where he's watching the ceremony happen and there's the video mm-hmm. that plays about, like, his arc throughout this whole movie was this and that. It's like, oh, they're manipulating <laughs> me this whole time. I dig that idea and the fact that he would respond to that by trying to evade a fight with his technique. You know, I also think Tiger Chin, despite being not a professionally trained actor is, like, a decent enough lead and I can get behind him, and there's also, like, put enough small, very obvious stuff that at least shows, like, okay, he's a guy I can at least is trying to improve his station, like, he keeps practicing English over the radio and all that other stuff. I think there, it shows, that, like, he's a guy who wants to improve himself in any case, and he just gets to and over his head. I, I, I dug all of that. I think it was balanced well in the fact that the acting, I mean, throughout the movie was, at best, little little bit more than wooden you know so i think it was like it was all it, it was but it wasn't all shoddy it was subpar yeah. acting for the but it wasn't most. bad and it, like it didn't no. make it it didn't have the effect that made it bad like sometimes if you would put take in one of those actors or that the type of acting that they did and put it in another movie it would be almost unbearable but the fact that it was all about the fighting and the visuals everybody was almost on the same level and even when keanu like yelled which start which startled which was me insane yeah. Yes, I, I don't know what hurt him, and I wanted to. <laughs> I wanted you know, to heal protect him. him. <laughs> okay. I wanted to heal that, um, but I think it fit well with it. That's why it wasn't that it, it wasn't so jarring that the lack of. Plus, it was all, you know, so much of it was about Tiger's fighting and stuff, and the other the side characters. Actually, you know, the cop, the uh, I don't remember her name, but the main cop wasn't bad at all. In fact, the whole no, pol- the, all the actors in the police force. Mm-hmm. ironically were like kind of even even the small part of them were kind of moving the movie along at like a respectable like you're like all right they're back on the scene something though, is though happening. i will say that's <laughs> like, the stuff that feels the most mechanical in the movie at the same time because it's not as much focused on yeah, the actual fighting true. and it's just more like we need to move the plot along here's the side plot that's going on that i yeah. don't really care that much about and also i think it has the weakest bit of direction that's subtle but it's just a moment that like i was very confused by where tiger's meeting up with that detective and she's like, okay, we're, so we're going to meet up with you at this point, right? Right. And then they go up to this, these two guys suddenly just, like, walk up to them in the police station. And you think, like, oh, are they going to, like, introduce themselves to Tiger? And then they immediately cut to him getting in the car. I'm like, what's happening? 
Right. I know. I was like, are they like in on it? Like, yeah, are they right. going to fight right now? <laughs> I do want to go back to what I said, though. I, I don't have a problem with the fight or what happened with the guy from the raid and Tiger. I just, we've seen what Ico Iowas can do as far as fighting and choreography and things like that. I f- felt like he should have maybe been in a different scene. Like, maybe it should have been him at the end. Maybe it should have been him. Like the guy who he was hitting, who was like doing the Shaolin practice, where he was taking all the pain. Mm-hmm. Like well, that, that was, was a big fight. That was so great, yeah. I that was really that. great. But that could have been Iko Iowas because that was one of the biggest fights. And th- to me, I just would like to see more of what he can do against his style of martial arts against this style. I got but, the vibe that you were supposed to know how much of a badass he was. Oh, one hundred percent. Yeah. Well, like, you figure, I think... again, this is a kung fu movie made by a guy who loves martial arts movies. Right. And who was so in on it that this is 2013, only a year after The Raid came out. So he was in on those guys way before most other people were. But that's all. I mean, I, I like how the the fight actually occurred and what happened in it. But I don't know. I just, every time I see that guy, I want to see him, like, just fucking stab guys or shoot them or do whatever the hell he's fighting with whatever is in his arm's reach. Uh, can we talk about the CGI of the car crash? Oh, yeah, that was terrible. <laughs> oh, good God. <laughs> I'm like, the, Heather went, okay, so this is this is really awful looking. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. It's like PlayStation. Like PlayStation yeah, I, 2. I was just listening to, um, um, I don't know if you know the podcast, Double Edge, Double Bill, the uh, uh, Spawn <laughs> episode earlier today when you guys were describing like what was the breaking point of uh, cgi when people started talking shit about it and literally i just started thinking this is a bad scene damn spawn <laughs> like i literally God like i was like spawn. it came full circle in that at the same time also i wouldn't mind maybe a bit of michael jai white <laughs> that's true oh yeah That'd be dope. why not yeah that's but you know the thing is he I guarantee you, like you already said, most of these guys are real fighters who have fought in tournaments. Not all of them are movie fighters. But Keanu Reeves, I guarantee you, did his research. I guarantee you, if you go to China and you watch this movie or Indonesia or wherever, people there know who these guys are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed. We don't because we're, you know, stupid gaijins. The fight choreography, everybody in it, like, you could tell they know their shit. Except for maybe piano keys at the end. <laughs> I mean, he's good. He learned his shit for the Matrix movies, but it felt a little wooden. I respected it only for the fact that it, I like loved the way that it kept kicking because it was almost like whoever choreographed it was like, okay, well, you don't really have a lot on him, so why don't you just keep it's him away by tall. kicking him? So just, yeah, so just keep like super kicking him. <laughs> like, Walk like an ostrich. That literally is all time. he did. Yeah. Walk like an ostrich. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I just like the fact that Keanu has, like, his demeanor throughout that whole fight is interesting, because especially, this is one of the few times I can recall where he's played a villain, and I dig the yeah. fact that he, in the scene, has, like, lost everything, and he is totally in rage-filled vengeance mode. So it kind of fits into, like, that he's not even quite as apt at fighting as a tiger is. I, I think that that works, and also... I. I just love the way he dies. And he, and he had to get his last line in, you know, like, <laughs> I, I knew you could do it. It's like, oh, you've been waiting your whole career to do that death, haven't you? <laughs> and just mean mugs him and then just like, eh. <laughs> just perfect. <laughs> and then they, <laughs> I love the fact that they just walk away too. like, let's just leave that there. <laughs> I'm just going to leave that corpse on the ground when I walk away. <laughs> I'm just waiting for the guys to come in just like, hey, we're going to finish remodeling. Oh, <laughs> we're going to leave. <laughs> And you let you clean that up. We'll be back in like an hour. We'll take lunch, guys. Lunch, lunch, lunch. <laughs> I love that whole subplot, too, because it was like you could tell it was such a profound part of his story arc. But at the same time, you're like, what? <laughs> like, why does this dude not want his temple fixed? Like, he seemed thoroughly upset before. Like, why is he more excited about this? Right. Would it have been better if Tiger was like a card sharp? <laughs> <laughs> Go gamble. <laughs> Texas Hold'em tournament, get him! But then, so they go through this whole arc. And at the end, he's like, "Yeah, all right, I'll sell it to you. Make it a cultural village." <laughs> like, wait a minute, yeah, what the fuck is going on here? No, but didn't you hear his great speech, Adam? They were trying. He's trying to like combine both sides 
Where it's like we, oh, yeah. we we must come together right. and have your chi realized or whatever the hell he said. It, you or know, it, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's yeah, just mysticism. Um, I will say the weakest point for the movie for me was the forced like romance, where you're like, I don't care. I don't care that he likes her. <laughs> like the girl at the patent office. Well, it wasn't a patent. I don't know. It might have been a patent office. Who the hell knows what it was it's, at this point? It's the hey, my temple's closing down. I gotta save the rest right. center office. office. <laughs> you can fix everything. You have the it's answer. The to temple everything. office. <laughs> right, the temple office. The things gotta be explained. Um, <laughs> that I didn't. I did not care about. And even the tag at the end where they're together and they run up the hill. Like I don't care. I don't know. I mean, like I said, I think it's you know it's perfectly serviceable. I mean, I wasn't that bothered by the romance necessarily, if nothing else, because, like, it is, it's a side thing, but also at the same time, she's the one that says, like, hey, you can make this a historical landmark, and we can kind of save this place. But she had an investment in his actual, like, studies and whatnot. It's not just a romance thing. I think it was, I didn't think it was the best part of the movie, but I thought it served its purpose fine. That girl <laughs> must really be into foreheads, too. Because that's one thing I will say, and I don't want to decry anybody's looks, but good God, what a wig he's wearing. How dare you insult that Tai Chi light bulb? <laughs> <laughs> he is a beautiful beacon of light bulb. <laughs> <laughs> well, at this point, rather than keep making fun of a guy who could kick all of our asses, let's go ahead and go oh, into final thoughts. <laughs> totally. Let's go into our final thoughts. Then, Heather, your final thoughts on Man of Tai Chi. Um, I, I actually enjoyed the movie for my, for what it was. I think I enjoyed his enthusiasm making it and even Keanu like acting. You could tell that he had the passion for what he was doing. So I definitely think it's worth a watch, especially if you like him, especially if you like Kung Fu movies. I mean, it's, it's a little long. It feels like sometimes those the Kung Fu movies only really should be long if it's more of like a fantasy or like a really thought out like world and this one just felt like it was the same storyline that you would expect in the fighting movie and it just kind of didn't wouldn't pick up speed at times but it also feels like a type of movie that if we're had a little bit more time to cook or if he made another one possibly like in another kind of thought process it would actually could be pretty much improved but work a lot better i just think it felt like it was like the first cut of the movie but i definitely think it's watchable and um, I, I enjoyed it for what it was. Adam? I actually pretty much agree with everything she said uh, for once. Um, <laughs> it is a little long in the tooth because it's got like three endings. But I think it's a perfectly serviceable uh, martial arts movie. There's not anything in it that makes me go, oh, God. But there's not anything in it either. that I'm like, oh, my God, you have to see this movie. Uh, I think it's fun, it's entertaining, it's got good choreography, but I do think it's ultimately kind of forgettable as well. I think it'll get lost in the haze. Would you all like to see Keanu do another movie as a director? Yeah, why not? I like the directing. I thought it was, like I said, I thought it was somebody who enjoyed movies, you could tell. He might have been trying a lot, but I enjoyed how he did it. Yeah, I almost wouldn't mind if he maybe did something a bit more skewed into genre. I agree, like something more like maybe a sci-fi actioner kind of thing. That'd be awesome. I think yeah. I think you could do a pretty good job with that. And I mostly agree with you guys. I liked it enough. Um, I think it's, it's on Netflix right now as we're recording. It's the perfect place to see it. Where you can have fun yeah. with it. It Pause at certain things. Go get something <laughs> and come back. Um, it, it, it kind of fits that tone, as it were. But I, I dig Tiger, Tiger Chen. I dug most of the fights. There's some points where you can tell Keanu's being a bit overzealous. But at the same time, there's a lot of passion that's involved in that. And he's fun as the villain. And we didn't even mention this, but I love that he has that black mask that come when he comes out. <laughs> That's so great. Oh, yeah, I weird. know. I wanted him to really fight cool. with it so bad. Like, I know, when right? it got kicked off, I was like, oh, man, I just wanted him to fight with it. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, Man of Tai Chi, yeah, it's pretty good. See it. And uh, in an unprecedented move, I think we all actually like the bad pick more, but not necessarily for our main topic reasons. Yes. So let's go ahead and get into... <laughs> Francis Ford Coppola's Bram Stoker's Dracula. I have crossed oceans of time to find you. What are you? He is a willing recruit. He is the devil's concubine. I want to be what you are. I want to see what you see. 
And so uh, this adaptation of Bram Stoker's famous novel uh, came out in November of 1992. It is uh, directed by Francis Ford Coppola, and we'll get this out of the way right now. This is something new for us, where usually when we have a bad pick, it's either a genuinely bad movie based around our topic, or maybe a movie that we all really like that gets done fair shake, or maybe even something we haven't seen before. This is a rare case where I think this is a great movie, but... Uh, for mm-hmm. the reasons of our topic, uh, its worst element really is Keanu Reeves here. And that was very famous at the time. A lot of people really, honestly, dismissed the whole movie because of Keanu, which, to be fair, he is not good as Jonathan Harker. No. Um, it's not good casting. It feels definitely like Francis Ford Coppola said as much. This was sort of a, I need to get a matinee idol from, to have kids actually come to my weird fucking vampire movie. <laughs> I think it was both with him and Winona Ryder. I agree. Like, I, they were hot star, hot young stars. So. Right, they were. Though I will say, I, at least upon this watch, like Winona Ryder a bit more. If nothing else, for the fact that I think she actually works pretty well as, like, the innocent who's seduced by Dracula until it gets to the sort of the weird fourth act of this movie, where she has to be, like, Dracula-possessed evil over the top. Yes. That's where she really falters for me. Um, but at the same time, she at least works more consistently than Keanu, who I've heard some people say this, and I think it's true. Keanu, at his most endearingly bad, feels like the jock who really wants to do well at the school play. Yes. Yes. So he can graduate. I, I have to say this. As soon as um, Adam said this was uh, we were talking about this movie, I have to say this is bad. Okay. The accent is awful. But the worst and exactly that kind of interpretation, Thomas, is him doing the the um, villain on Much to Do About Nothing. Yes, because he's reciting he's reciting Shakespeare in the worst British accent ever, and it's like I, you can't even watch it. Like at least this while I was watching this, I'm like, oh my god, this is bad too. But I think it's exactly that kind where it's like a jock, like ah, to be or not right. to be. <laughs> that like... is the question. <laughs> the, the, the tragedy, though, is I don't think it's from lack of trying necessarily. If anything, no. it feels like in this movie, it's out of his wheelhouse. No, it, dude, that's all. It's out of his wheelhouse, and more importantly, it feels like he's trying too hard to be to make this work. You can see it on his face that he's trying, but it never feels like he's actually authentically in this world. Especially because he's playing things at highest at like a five, whereas everyone else in this movie is playing at like a ten thousand. Yeah, that's and it, true. And he's up against titans yes. of acting. I mean, most of his scenes are shared with Gary Oldman, yeah. for God's sakes. I mean, the poor guy, he he was doomed to fail. I mean, it's stunt casting. It's Hollywood stunt casting, obviously. Got to get a name in here so people will come see it. I mean, that's what it is. And, yeah, he tried. I still don't know why they put that fucking, like, gray spray paint in his hair. <laughs> they put baby powder in his fucking hair to make him look great. I mean, obviously. Oh. That's the most school play element of this, especially in a, oh. in a movie that has such phenomenal, like, production design and makeup and everything else. It's just like, oh, we ran out of money. Keanu, here's a baby powder. It's a, yeah, it's like a ferret bath where you put that powder in a sock. <laughs> They're just hitting him in the face with it. Oh, uh, Oh. oh, my God. He's grown young again. <laughs> like, oh, what the fuck is going on with this? <laughs> I see you found Mina. I thought I lost her. Dear what? Mina, Dracula wants me to stay a few more days to teach him about our British custom. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. I'm headed to Budapest. <laughs> Fuck is cool. And especially for, like, there's points where he does the British accent, and then other points where he does the South Californian accent, and he switches yeah. line to line at points. Mm-hmm. <laughs> My thing is, you got Carrie Ells in here, just make Carrie Ells hard. I, I exactly, I totally oh, yeah. agree with that, yeah. It, it, Keanu, really? Like, really? If anything, I would have loved Keanu as the Texan character that Billy Campbell plays. It completely worked. Yes. Would have completely worked. It's like he's surprised he's in the movie. Like the doe-eyed expression. Yeah. Like you could tell he got in. He was like, "All right, oh no." 
this is super scary. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like this could have been like an episode of that live action Bill and Ted show, and you could see like yeah. Alex Winter in the audience, like, you're getting it, Ted? Keep doing it. <laughs> it just it, it does not quite work at all. But enough of that, because um I think we all do agree though, aside from that, this movie's fucking great. Like I love yeah. so much about this fucking movie. <laughs> Look, I love Dracula as a character. I love everything about it, from Bella Lugosi to Christopher Lee to Frank Langella to... To Adam Sandler in the Hotel Transylvania films, of course. <laughs> yeah, but even that, though, he's enjoyable. Yes, yeah, I, mean, I agree, yeah. I'm going to say, on record, right now, Gary Oldman's Dracula is my favorite Dracula. It's a bold statement. It's a bold statement. I don't give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> he's... He he is literally from the first scene he's in giving it his all the entire time. He does not let up. He is so fucking good to the point to where because Gary Oldman is not a conventionally good looking man, at least in my opinion, I don't know. You believe that women would want to go to him with the way he acts, especially when he shows up in modern, well, modern for the time, but in London as the young, you know, Dracula again. I, I just. And, again, Anthony fucking Hopkins in this movie is so unhinged and crazy. But he's awesome. Essentially playing what I feel like Tommy Wiseau is always trying to be. Good point. I think you're accurate on that. And Greg Sestero, on the other hand, is uh, Keanu. Um, (laughs) Mina, I can't believe you did this. I can't believe you cheated on him. This is your (laughs) fault. (laughs) Jesus Christ. Everything else in this movie, I mean, from the creature design to the makeup effects to the set design to even the bold choices he makes, like showing the eyes in the in the skyline when Keanu's on the fucking train talking about Budapest. <laughs> you know, that type of stuff. I mean, it's really bold. Well, and not to mention that uh, Francis Ford Coppola decided to do all of this, like, old school practically. And yeah. you can tell, like, the aesthetic of it feels like this is a Val Luton film done in, like, 1992. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. That's what it feels like, and that's such an eerie, sort of dreamlike quality that just permeates throughout this whole movie. And I do love Gary Oldman as Dracula, I think, because what you mentioned, that he's not the most conventionally good-looking guy. Um, he's What I like is the fact that it almost plays into Dracula's sort of tragedy as a character. He feels like mm-hmm. somebody who exudes so much confidence, but is so tortured inside. It fits perfectly for that, and I, I do agree. I think Gary Oldman is giving so much of his all and shows so much range from being like the old guy that we see at the beginning to when he... when he's speaking straight Hungarian in the very right. Beginning. I mean, dude, there was no question in the very beginning that that guy's a badass warrior. He is exactly who he is. And it was the old man. There's no question he's a tortured old man. You know, who's lived for God knows how long now and is still just in love with one person. And then when he's young Dracula again, there's no question that he's in love again. What a performance. He covers all the bases in this performance. And when he becomes missed, you believe he's really missed. I he's not. <laughs> oh, Misty Oldman. <laughs> oh, yeah, all oh, that's is one of his tricks. <laughs> he was a really bad illusionist. But but uh, what about you, Heather? What are some of the things you also like about this movie? I I agree um even w- in terms of when you're saying the bold choices. I like how you any one of those actions from even the dream light, the what are the shadows doing in the background, like the scene with Keanu and the three chicks, like coming out of the bed, like they could, any one of those scenes could have been taken just a hair stronger, would have been campy. And I mean, it was kind of veining on campy for the respect of the source material, but it was done so well and handled so well that it was like, like you just totally accepted it and it fit into the feel. And that's why it was one of the masterpieces of the movie. And of course with, I mean, Oldman just did it great. He, mm-hmm. cause like you said, there's a tragic character, but you also, he's, you know, he's a vampire. He's he feeding babies fuck. to chicks, yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> like it, to be able to sympathize and yet hate and love a character all at the same time, even knowing such an, like a obvious story arc, you already know Dracula. You already, you know, there's, you know, the story, you know, the, you've seen the movies, like you get it. And just to have somebody come in and take it, it's still do the same story, story arc, still follow you on, take you on the same journey. But you're like, oh, 
<laughs> you know, I was like, new. I'm in awe. <laughs> you turn to Keanu. Whoa! <laughs> Whoa it, it, right, no, I, I agree with you, Heather. It's it's the same thing everybody knows. Like, Thomas Hume brought up Hotel Transylvania. Kids know who Dracula is. I mean, it'll never. the story will never die. But you'd be able to watch this 1992 version, which, God, when did the Bela Lugosi one come out? In the 30s? Yeah. So for you to watch a, this movie that's come out maybe 60 years later, Dracula, again, but... It's completely different. He makes completely different choices, complete, and it makes the character feel fresh again. You're like, this is a fucking different type of Dracula. I agree with you, Heather. I think it just works on so many levels, almost every level, except for Jonathan Harker <laughs> <laughs> and his goddamn baby powder bath. <laughs> But see, that just goes show what good movie it is, because even with all that going on, and he's still a pretty big part of the movie, you're like, I'll accept it. Yeah, <laughs> I'll right, accept right, this. He, he's the control for this experiment. You gotta have <laughs> something was... there to ground it a bit more and something familiar. <laughs> but I, I think especially, like, I, I agree with about, like, most performers here are so good. Especially, we haven't mentioned him. Fucking Tom Waits' as Renfield is so great. You want to know what's crazy? Tom Waits. Tom gravelly-ass voice Waits has a way better British accent than Keanu Reeves could ever do. Yeah, and so convincing. And that dude, I believe that guy would be, like, eating fucking bugs in the corner of a uh, mental asylum, which I also love that, like, the guards have the metal cages around their heads to guard them from yeah, people. Very cool. it's so great. And he, just the way that he talks like Richard E. Grant, or especially when Owner Wright was just like, I pray that I never see you again. Go, master! Great. So awesome. You know what I noticed too, watching it again, which I think is the funniest thing I've ever seen. Richard E. Grant, when they first show him, he's like, Thomas, come here. And it's one of the guards in a metal cage, and the guy walks over to him, he's like, Wait here. And he walks away. <laughs> <laughs> come here, I need to talk to you. All right, I'll be back. <laughs> Holy shit. But, um, I walked all the way over here. I have no perifs. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Seriously, the thing is heavy. What? <laughs> <laughs> Dude, like half bat, half human Dracula. What a fucking practical effects marvel. What a great suit. And what a great scary scene. Yeah, or even him as like the the werewolf type creature, which I did love. The, around this time is also when I watched like Fright Night. And I had the yeah. same problem with both those movies where as a youngin, I was just like, vampires can't turn to werewolves. This is bullshit. I don't believe any of this. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, you grow up and you realize, one, that was always a thing, and two, it's bullshit anyway, why do you care? <laughs> right, exactly, why did you draw the line in the sand? No, dude, I'm, just, I'm right there with you. Like, even in, like, Blade, I'm like, silver to the kill vampire, to kill the werewolf. Goddamn. <laughs> Get it right. <laughs> yeah, you can make up the as much as you want. But that, even that scene, to me, stuck with me. when He's, like, the half-wolf, and he's, uh, um, having sex with uh, Lucy. He's raping Lucy at that point. It's disturbing. Yeah, and then at the same time, once he becomes human, and you're just like, oh, but he's such a tragic dreamboat, Gary Oldman. <laughs> he because he loves Mina, so I guess. In this instance, you're like, you're like no, dude. But, but also what works is the fact that you know that whole time he's also got that hypnotizing effect over her. Like, that's what works so geniusly about, like, his seduction is the fact that it's clear, like, he is hypnotizing her with a lot of charisma, a lot of charm, just the the lines that he spews about, like, I, I crossed oceans of time. He just has such a commitment to, like, I have been waiting for eons to be with you, and you kind of get swept up in that at the same time, yeah. But he means it, too. Like, that's the thing, it's not a line. He means it. I mean, it might be a line in the fact that he wants to turn her so she'll be with him forever as well, but he means all of it. Like he's she been can waiting become for her. one herself. <laughs> <laughs> that might be my favorite Dracula, Leslie Nielsen. But <laughs> no, it, it's and I mean, like I already said, Gary Oldman's fantastic. But I, I got to go back again to fucking how unhinged Anthony Hopkins is in this movie. This is him mm -hmm. right after Silence of the Lambs. This is his follow up. He's cutting that whole steak. He's like, yeah, there were. Chop off a head and put a steak in a hot. <laughs> like he's like he doesn't give a fuck. He he's so crazy. I love him in this. But I I also want to say that in, we talked about how great the cast is. Also, 
this is probably the last great movie Francis Ford Coppola ever made. This is honestly, it's not too far off for me from, like, I love the two first two Godfathers and Apocalypse Now, obviously. But this is, like, right close to that for me, because it, it's like you said, he has so much more passion in him. Because this was about a decade after, like, he had one from the heart, and that completely bankrupted his American Zoetrope studio, so he just kept making blockbuster after blockbuster to, like, make some of his fucking debt go away. And this feels like the first one where he's like, okay, I really want to do something different, and I want to do something unique for this. Just something out of the box. And he does such a marvelous job with it. It's a shame that, like, I think this took all of the creative energy out of him for a while, because then he follows this up with, like, Jack. Remember oh, Jack? Yeah. <laughs> you did Jack? Yep, he directed with Jack. Rocky Williams? Yep. Whoa. Oh, I didn't well. know that. Okay. Wait, well, well. Jack, um, wow. And this movie was controversial when it came out, too. I imagine. In the same way Interview with the Vampire was controversial, where there's a lot of sex and, you know, sex with blood, there's always going to be a problem in movie with people. It's, that's and, normal anyways. I don't know what everyone's big deal is. If you're doing it right. Hey, hey, hey. Anyways, it's, uh, that's all. Jesus Christ. <laughs> um, <laughs> good Lord. Um, but no, it was very controversial because A, the runtime, it was a long movie for the time. And B, people at this point were still not ready for a new Dracula. You gotta figure Dracula back in the day was like Batman or Superman now. The Universal Monsters, people wanted Boris Karloff. And then once Hammer came out with Christopher Lee, though Christopher Lee's Dracula now. You don't want new Draculas. Or the way they look. I mean, they all had the standard, you know, Widow's Peak. 100%. Cat, 100%. The Red Medallion. Right. You know, the capes. And then you get Gary Oldman with long hair and a beard wearing, like, Boop head. iced tea sunglasses and, you know, things like that. You're like, this isn't fucking Dracula. And, yes, the boob hair. Everybody <laughs> had a big thing with that. But, I mean, I'll be damned if this movie, if it doesn't still hold up. I mean, this is just... What a triumph. Well, and especially, it started a weird sort of craze of, like, trying to make these um, universal monsters a bit more palpable, where you had, like, the Mary Shelley's Frankenstein Whoa, Robert's hero. Oh, God. And then also, and uh, Jack Nicholson's wolf. Remember when we're like, hey, Mike Nichols, make a sexy werewolf movie with Jack Nicholson. Jack Nicholson and Michelle Pfeiffer. Really? You never yeah, saw man. that? No. Oh, man. But I will say this, Thomas, James Spader and Wolf is awesome. Oh my it's... god, yes! I know what you're talking about, god. <laughs> Anyways, yeah. No, I agree with you. This was this started it. Uh, and Kenneth Branagh's Frankenstein is atrocious. It's it's not it's, it's not good. It's so bad. <laughs> and the thing is, they've how many times now have they retried? Dracula told them they were going to redo it. No, 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 that's not an actual reboot. We're going to do something else. You just can't do it. It's like lightning in a bottle. Stop. Thomas, we've talked about like remakes or reboots and things like that. I have no problem with them, really, because the original will always be there. But with a lot of the Universal Monsters ones, even Dracula, because this movie, as much as I love it, it's a four out of five for me. I mean, the only reason it's five is literally because of Keanu and Winona Ryder. They're almost perfection, the originals. So I think that's the reason this one stands out compared to the other remakes, it's because it's such a ballsy turn. And if anything, the ones that have come after this one feel like they're trying to ape this particular entry. Because mm-hmm. like Dracula Untold, even and they're oh. like uh, Dracula Two Thousand. I think they're, oh. they're all trying to go. <laughs> they're all kind of trying to go for this bravado in some different way. And I just feel like if you're gonna do it again, I like the whole thing that apparently now they're gonna try and have Blumhouse do like the Invisible Man. Yeah. With, uh, like Lee Winnell. do more like a Blumhouse model of like make a two to five million dollar budget yeah, movie that's just character piece. focused yeah because yeah. i mean look right. at the del toro wolfman what a fucking just a bore fest right as opposed to guillermo del toro doing a love story with the fucking gill man the black lagoon i mean it's yeah, it worked. yeah oh and by the way i dude gerard butler's dracula why is dracula so scottish and so <laughs> sexy yeah <laughs> I can't wait to bite your neck. Come here. <laughs> Am I seducing you? Uh, <laughs> I've got it pissed all over myself. 
you play golf, do you? We haven't had a better Dracula since this. Let's put it that way. I don't know. Adam Salem Hotel Transylvania. But... <laughs> oh, two cabins. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that, um, but it, it's just more an issue of, like, really set yourself apart if you're ever going to try and do Dracula again. That's what all those other versions at least tried to do. Like, there's, uh, despite how similar they look, Bela Lugosi is far and away different from, like, Christopher Lee. Like, they both have very different approaches to the character. I think that's the way you definitely have to go, as opposed to, like I mentioned, sort of doing the... Uh, Gary Oldman Dracula, but either Super 2000 or Super Blockbuster Superhero Movie doesn't quite work in either direction. So you gotta really do something distinct like this does, and I especially would... I can't stress enough how much I love, like, all the art direction and yeah, the makeup in this movie is so phenomenally well done, or even, we haven't talked about this at all, which is bizarre, the score, the operatic giant massive score is great. It's absolutely phenomenal. And I, I agree with you. I can't can't get behind the the art direction more than I already am. Like I said, the, the even the scene where it's the peacock and then it turns to an eyeball and then it's the eyeballs in the skyline. I mean, that has stuck with me since I saw this movie. It, it, there's it, there's nothing to it. It's just it's so unnerving and eerie. And this movie has hundreds of scenes like that. I mean, the blood shooting all over the bed, the blood coming out of the cross, the... The opening battle sequence that looks almost like shadow puppets. Yes, is fantastic. Uh, I mean, they're dancing with the room spinning around them. I mean, it's just... Dracula's armadillo armor. (laughs) I love that. Which I love. Yeah, Yeah, me too. I love his (laughs) armadillo. But fuck, man. I think we gotta get back on it, because it's the point. Keanu really... Like, I don't blame him. And I'm glad they didn't get Johnny Depp. I know that was their original option, but, like, the studio was like, no, we need more of, like, a heartthrob. Right, which in 1992, apparently, he quite wasn't. Which is fucking insane to me. Because <laughs> that, that, that's post-21 Jump Street. Right, are you telling me Johnny Depp wasn't a heartthrob? And he's been a heartthrob for as long as I can remember. He looks like Keith Richards now. That's how long he's been a heartthrob. I mean, the guy's... <laughs> He's a, he was a beautiful man. He looks like, I'm sure, what his Dorian Gray portrait looked like in 1992. Yeah, right. Just real haggard and like oil all over it. Um, <laughs> soaked in wine. <laughs> yeah, just soaked in wine with cigarette birds. That just goes to show how to out of touch studio execs are. Right, but at the same time, it's so interesting also from just the perspective of his career, where he really took this, I think, much ado about nothing to heart, and ended up turning like that into speed right after that which is one of his, like, big seminal movies and was a great use yeah. of him. But at the same time, I think you can also use yeah. Keanu in sort of, like, uh, the similar way. Like, I, I think right before this, he does My Own Private Idaho. Oh, that was a good movie. And a way better Shakespearean oh, turn because yeah. he's doing Henry the Fourth and Fifth yeah. in that movie, and he's doing a great job of it. Like I mentioned earlier, his comedic turn, and I love you to death, uh, with him oh, and my William God. Hurt, it's drug funny. addicts. I mean, they're hilarious. <laughs> Him in Parenthood as a side character. I mean, he does work well in bit parts when it's something that maybe he's not right for, but he can still pull it off in bit parts because he's that committed. As long uh, as everybody else is like on the same page, like I like the you same guys, like, energy level. Yeah, exactly. Because like, yeah. that's why I stuck out so f- like obvious in this one. Like everybody else, like you guys said, were were just acting their anuses off, and he was just swimming by. <laughs> I'm really curious about him, like, along with John Wick, another big uh, summer blockbuster he's in this year, is he's going to play a bit part in Toy Story 4, where he's playing, like, apparently, like, a evil Knievel-style action figure that's Canadian. <laughs> that seems very appropriate. <laughs> yeah, that, that totally seems, like, and in the clips I've seen of him, like, oh, this is, he's like, Duke Kaboom. Duke that, that, that's Kaboom. Perfect. Or I'm actually very, I'm very curious as to how, and I'd, like, I'm a little bit apprehensive, but I'm very curious how the next uh, Bill and Ted is going to go. How they're even going to go about that. Is it coming out next year, I think? It, it, they, they're saying it's coming out next year, and the concept, which I've said on the show before, but I love, is that, like, at all these many years later, Bill and Ted have still not made the song that unites everybody. So they're kind of, like, middle-aged, washed up, and they're like, dude, what are we going to do? Apparently there's a big <laughs> universe-ending threat that they have to write the greatest song in the world in order to save us. <laughs> 
for, <laughs> which I'm, I, I think that sounds like a fun idea. And I think if anything else, he has gained so much more of like a self-awareness about who he is that I think started, you wouldn't have that without this movie. Like yeah. as many issues as we have with him in this movie, this feels like it's a big turning point. It's a big mistake that he made that he realized and learned from. And I think really great ways from here in his career. I think you can almost tell that people, especially other actors around them, or maybe even studios because of how where he gets his money from now, is that people are, are able to engage with him because he's either, he's probably pretty easy to work with, especially even the stories that we've heard from just, you know, um, of fans that I think everyone's just almost everyone's rooting for him. You know what I'm saying? So he can do these things. He can achieve these things. And because it's like you you almost like, yeah, let's just let's see what else he can do. And he just goes to work. He does what he's got to do. And he goes home. And you don't see that a lot in actors liking kind of propelling or even. Especially like action movie actors. Because that's, that's basically true. what he is. Yeah. And you can tell he likes it. Yeah. And I guess we can spin this off into our final thoughts about Dracula overall then, uh, Heather. It's a really anyone that likes horror, especially in that time frame too, like um, because that was like period. Would you, yeah, or wouldn't you say that's like right before like? Oh no, you said it was right after Silence, but I was saying thinking like right during that weird kind of thriller horror, like more people it became more blockbustery. Um, but I think even then, like even if you don't want to into super horror, nothing like that, just the story arc and everything is real. It's just good. You're going to enjoy it and you're going to enjoy that the world that you capture because it's almost like it's a movie written. It's obviously written by a book or to cover a book, but it's almost like it captures the spirit of if you're reading a book, because you know how when you're reading a book, everything kind of gets fanciful. You get loose images or like dreamlike. And I think it captures that well in a visual form. So even out of that, if you like movies and how they're made or just if you want to get transported into what they're the movie's about i think that's what it lends itself to very very well so yeah i like it. it's a good movie <laughs> it's a movie that feels like it's being painted frame for frame as you're watching exactly it. much better <laughs> it's concise i did it <laughs> Adam. i i agree too i think this is a master class of how to uh, display how visuals and the visual medium can work for you to push a story along. You don't just have to point the camera at something. It's a it's a very good example of... I, I think this is a brilliant, brilliant take on Dracula. The only reason this is not a perfect 5 or perfect 10 or whatever you want to... Whatever scale you rate it on, for me, is uh, because of Keanu Reeves and Winona Ryder's performances. And I don't blame them. Uh, they took the role, and I do believe that they both are giving it everything they got. I just think it's a little bit above their range. For both of them. But other than that, I, I mean, I love this movie. I absolutely love this movie. As we talked about last week with Scott Pilgrim being a, like a feast for the eyes, I think this is the same exact way. I, there's always something to look at. There's always a trick. There's always a visual gag. There's something happening in every frame of this movie that just makes it a, it just makes this movie a fantastic experience to watch. I I, I if you if no if you appreciate Dracula or vampires, then this ha if you haven't seen this, it has to be on the top of your list. Yeah, I mean, I I agree that I think um, Keanu and sort of the later stuff with Benoni, and also we didn't really talk about, it, but I think the weird sort of fourth act this movie has, where like the they barge in on right before uh, Dracula can turn Winona, and then he leaves the Transylvania, and they all have to go to Transylvania, and they have their big chase. It just feels sort of awkwardly plotted. I don't know if that's a thing in the novel, because I never, I never did read the Bram Stoker novel. I, I started to after, like, I read Mary Shelley's Frankenstein in high school, and I'm like, this is great, now I gotta read Dracula. I'm like, this is a fucking diary? Fuck this shit. Yeah, I, I never finished it. It's I so started hard. it. Yeah. No, yeah, that, that wasn't quite my thing um but as it stands this movie is i i really love it feels almost like it's also the last time a movie like this could have been made because coppola insists on not doing any cg and this is literally the year before jurassic park and when that was a you could never go back to that like there, there's no way that no studio would want them to do any kind of cg at all involved and that it creates this dreamlike atmosphere that turns into nightmares and turns into almost like an erotic thrillerish dream at the same time there's it goes through so much but at the same time you feel so immersed in the world <laughs> and these characters the, except for Keanu that you don't ever quite lose your pacing with it I, I really do I agree this is it's one of my favorite Coppola movies and it's such a damn great showcase of what sort of you can do with horror and how malleable it could be especially in this 
weird period of the 90s that had a, a lot of variety that people don't give a lot of credit to for the genre. Uh, but that is the end of our discussion on our two Keanu Reeves films. Um, before we do our picking for next week with a different star as our topic, uh, we have some feedback to read because we ask all of you on our Facebook and Twitter feed, which is at DEDDPod, about what are your favorite and least favorite examples of whatever topic we're doing. And uh, because it's Keanu here, we asked all of you about that. And so we have some people, including a uh, friend of the show, Tori DePina, says uh, for his favorites of Keanu's, uh, The Matrix 1 and 2, Hardball, The Scanner Darkly, the previous two John Wick movies, and The Gift rank among my faves. The least, I've never been um, as harsh uh, on his acting as some others have been, but he's been in crap, obviously, whether it be the third Matrix film, The Day the Earth Stood Still, or 47 Ronin. Uh, Lance Langford of the Horror Returns podcast says, uh, The Matrix is an absolute blast. The sequel's not so much. Let's not forget the awesome Bill and Ted films. And as for bad, Dane DeHaan's Keanu impression of <laughs> Larian, City of a Thousand Planets. <laughs> Uh, James Rodriguez says uh, he may be young, dumb, and full of cum, but Keanu absolutely makes the role of Johnny Utah work in the brilliant Point Break. I also have a soft spot for his creepy hotel manager role in The Neon Demon. As for bad, The Dull Street Kings gives Keanu nothing to work with, and it was un it unfortunately shows. At least it wasn't the bad match, though. Uh, Rafe Telsch says, uh, good, the Matrix trilogy, Bill and Ted, Speed, etc. Really enjoyed The Lake House as a serious turn for him. And the Scanner Darkly, although most of his dramatic stuff is meh, not bad per se, just not great. Um, and then bad adaptations and remakes are his weakest area. Johnny Monomic, Constantine, and The Day the Earth Stood Still just beg the question, why was this even made? Uh, Will Torres says, The Devil's Advocate for Best and Worst Every Other Film. Um, and Brian Kane says, uh, I'm a fan of A Scanner Darkly, a movie that uses Keanu's strengths to his benefit. I also have a soft spot for Hardball. The bad one should be obvious, but I can't say anything bad about this guy. I love that he's doing his damnedest to make martial arts movies popular again. Accurate. Um, now, I'm going to go ahead and say that I will agree with Tori on most of that. Except for maybe The Matrix 2, which I think is just awful. Um, and Hardball I like, but Hardball is such a formulaic movie. I mean, I've seen that movie, that story, a hundred times over. So, I mean, great, but meh. I do like The Gift, though. That is super underrated. Yeah, that's a very underrated movie. Isn't that Raimi? That is Raimi, yes, and it's different for him. It's also oh, very different for Keanu, because he's playing, like, an abusive southern da drunk dad. Mm -hmm. who, and he's really good. Mm -hmm. He's very terrifying, which is so against type for him. But that's an example where it worked where you play within his wheelhouse and also doesn't crowd up the movie that much at the same time either. Um, I will say, I did actually rewatch the Matrix trilogy because the 20th anniversary of the Matrix just happened, like, in March. So I was yeah, just like, yeah, let sure. me rewatch those movies. And the first Matrix, obviously, still great. Just one of the best, oh, yeah. like, big-budget sci-fi action movies ever. And I don't like the Matrix sequels, but I at least have a respect for the fact that as much as they do fuck up, I would argue that no other bad turns for film series are quite like the Matrix sequels. They are unique in terms of how just weird they decided to go. And I, I mean, they went completely off the fucking rails. Yeah, and even Reloaded does have some awesome things like the whole freeway fight thing or even the big mm -hmm. um, kung fu fight that happens, which Keanu actually fights against Tiger Chen in at like the stairwell. Holy shit, that is Tiger Chen. Right, he's one of the guys in that fight scene. Um, there's, there's I, a lot I of... gotta be honest, I thought that was a lady. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> That's no joke. <laughs> um, but any of those other ones uh, spark your interest, Heather? Well, I, I love The Matrix. Actually, that's where my uh, childhood obsession happened with Keanu. I went through over four different my age here vhs's of the matrix i would watch it over and over and over and over and over and over again and i just have to say i don't care how shitty the movie is i loved johnny mnemonic like i was a kid i do too, too. like i, I think it's just, I just loved it. fun I think it could have been just because i was so obsessed with the matrix so i was because the second one had, didn't come out till was it two years later 2003 two yeah, yeah so, so it was a while years. like four years, four years. Yeah. yeah so i had you know so it was my film between that but i like i said the matrix was my end all my like i said i literally at one point broke it in the vs vcr started crying and then my dad had to buy it for me again <laughs> that's how much i watched it um 
So, yeah, that one I agree with. But oh, I like um, – I don't know if I've seen Hardball. I did I did mm-hmm. like The Gift. I remember thinking it was going to be a completely different movie. Um, and as for the second two Matrixes, like I think because I had overrun myself with the first one, that once I got to the second one, it wasn't following the same suit. It didn't – felt like a different movie altogether. I think Completely. I just kind of lost it. But – um. Yeah, I agree with most of them, except for I, I love Johnny Mnemonic. <laughs> I love Johnny Mnemonic. Johnny Mnemonic has Ice-T, a talking dolphin, and Dolph Lundgren as a fucking cyborg street preacher. Who's also There's nothing bad. Be- <laughs> what, I mean, what is better than that? I have not seen Johnny Mnemonic. Oh, no, you have to. Henry Rollins is in it, too, and there's so is Udo Kier and Laser Fink. I'm curious, but then again, also, the, Keanu had a lot of blind spots for me until this year. Like, I hadn't seen Point Break until earlier this year. I hadn't seen Speed until, like, two days ago. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> the Speed's okay. It was everywhere, no, yeah. Honestly, like, that's the thing. is like, I was worried it was going to be kind of overrated for me. And I was actually really sucked into Speed. I, yeah, it's fun. It is the only Die Hard ripoff that comes anywhere close to Die Hard. Yeah, I agree. That's a good yep. point. And by the way, I think a lot of people shit on 47 Ronin who haven't seen it. I liked it. I don't think 47 Ronin is that bad. Let's put it this way. 47 Ronin is easily better than that fucking great wall movie with Matt Damon. I think 47 Ronin is a visual, like, fucking mind-blowing. It's amazing. Um, I like the world it was attempting to establish. I I just think it wasn't, like, it it was either too, yeah. What's the word? Ambitious. Yes, that's a good way to put it. I also agree with what James said. Um, the Neon Demon is a very weird movie, and I really, I really like his very small turn. He plays like a creepy hotel manager. That yeah, it, who directed that? Uh, that's Nicholas Winding Refn, the uh, driver. That's what I thought. Yeah, Drive and uh, Bronson. Right. Yeah. yeah, that guy. I, I, I dig that movie. It's very odd, and I think it's a good use of him. It's well, similar to like a gift role, where it's a small mm-hmm. use of him, but it really works for his advantages. Um, and I did also rewatch the Bill and Ted movies. I'm going to actually say, I think I prefer Bogus Journey. Excellent you are adventure. out of your fucking mind, both of you. <laughs> what the fuck? Excellent Adventure has sort of like the cleaner story, but I think Bogus Journey has like the more interesting, weird turns. Like, oh, they're going to go to hell. Oh, they're going to go to heaven and get two small little alien guys to build good robots for them. Oh, they're going to recruit death into their band. Yes. You guys, you guys, I don't know that I can either, A, be committed. I can't be committed to either of you anymore <laughs> after this. This uh, is fucking ridiculous. Hey, Heather, you got like an hour and a half free every week. I... <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh... Now I do. <laughs> <laughs> I will agree on the devil's advocate. I love the devil's advocate. I think Keanu Reeves' southern Florida accent is strangely weird because it's still not his normal accent. I don't know why he wouldn't just speak in his normal accent. But I do love The Devil's Advocate. I think there are genuinely terrifying things in that movie. And I think post-Scent of a Woman Al Pacino performance where he wasn't the hoo guy. I don't know. He's not that far off, though. (laughs) He's not that far off. But I think he's really good in that movie. Oh, no. And plus he has great dialogue to spew like, God is an absentee land. And plus, that works where Keanu is kind of wooden, but it works as sort of like a base for fucking Al Pacino to, like, bark at. I think that that's yeah. also, I, I would argue that's also what works for me to disagree with James on this. Um, Street Kings is a very fun guilty pleasure movie for me. Really? I mean, you gotta figure, Street Kings came out, what, like a year or two after Training Day? 2008. So yeah, I think Training Day was what? 2001. So no, there's a huge gap. <laughs> training Day is like Are 2001. You yes, yes. <laughs> Uh, okay, well, maybe, but fuck you. Uh, but Street Kings, to me, felt like a they were trying to rip off Training Day. Oh, 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 hey, it's a David Ayer movie. Shocker, he's trying to repeat himself, as he does every time he writes a fucking like crime movie. He's pretty much trying to do Training Day. You are not a David Ayer fan. I, I, I think he repeats himself a lot. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, but Street Kings, I think, works in spite of... Like you mentioned, it is very much ripping off Training Day, but I think in a way that's consistently like, wait, we're going with this turn? We're doing this? Force Whitaker's drooping his eye this way? (laughs) Um, (laughs) I think it's a very watchable, not well-made movie. (laughs) So I did want to say, to go back to what I was saying about Bogus Journey, what I think ultimately sells that a bit more for me is the fact that 
I love him and Alex Winter as the evil Bill and Ted. Yeah, I, I think that is what I think slightly irks it up because it's such. It's probably the first time Keanu was self aware, and I, I just dig that. Especially whenever they're like trying to like laugh about something, just like oh, we're gonna kill him, <laughs> and then they go silent, and then they put on sunglasses or some shit, and shit. It's so funny. I just love all of that shit. I do dig Scanner Darkly as well. By the way, I think not only is Keanu good in it, I think Robert Downey Jr. is fantastic in that. And I actually think Woody Harrelson gives one of his best performances in that movie. And crazy, it's Keanu Reeves and Winona Ryder. But I, I, I do like Scanner Darkly. Have you seen Scanner Darkly, Thomas? Uh, no, I have not seen a Scanner Darkly. It's a cell shaded animated movie. I'm, I'm aware of it. I mean, it's Richard Linklater, too. It's a very weird seeming turn. Keanu Reeves is in it. I'm just going to pretend that you don't know what it is. Wait, Keanu's in it? Re- Whoa. Yeah, he's in it. Uh, Richard Linklater did Whoa. I know. Crazy. It's called The Scanner Darkly. My problem with The Scanner it's Darkly is when it came out, like it was like the hip, the hip mm. movie. So it was like, I just didn't see it in time. And by the time that I was ready to see it, everyone's like, oh, why haven't you seen it? And I'm like, well, uh, it sucks. I bet. Oh, screw you guys. <laughs> so I like <laughs> took me years to see it just out of spite. I mean, I'm always curious to see him because I think him and Winona Ryder have an interesting chemistry in other movies. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm down for that. Especially, I mean, they apparently got married on the set of Dracula, technically, because they used they a did. real priest for that set for that yep. scene. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I guess I don't know. Um, but we also had some feedback to read that was um, more in reference, to, like some of our past episodes. Uh, first, Brian King. Actually, I had this to say in reference to our last video game-themed episode, uh, where with a picture of M. Bison, he said, Listening to Double Edge Double Bill was the most important day of your life. For me, it was a Tuesday. Clever. We like that, Brian. Uh-huh. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. We like it. Um, and then Oliver Sloan actually had these to say about, like, in terms of his... <laughs> Every you know, yeah. time, Oliver. Every, Every time. Every time, he's just like, he just misses the cutoff. Like, he just posts, like, right after we record. Honestly, at certain I know, points. I know. Um, but he had to say uh, for the video game movies, uh, Double Dragon, Dead or Alive, Street Fighter slash Street Fighter Legend of Chun Li. Uh, so we don't know if that's good or bad. I'm so. assuming he means bad. He uh, has to be bad. I don't know, but he loves all. And you know what? I'll say Dead or Alive is at least a very faithful video game. Oh, you're out of your fucking mind. That's a terrible film. I'm not saying it's a good film. I'm saying it's very faithful in terms of it's a lot of stupid fighting and uh-huh. bikini volleyball. <laughs> That's what Eric Dead or Alive Robert is. puts on Oakley's and knows Kung Fu because of it. <laughs> it's a terrible Never problem. said it was good. Just said it's very faithful to the stupid video games it's based on. I think he, I think he kind of did. I think he kind of did. I think you uh, liked it's, that movie. You know, it, it's like the two Godfather movies right underneath Dead or Alive. <laughs> and the Dead or Just, Alive? Yeah. yeah. Two guys, Malty Salkin, Dead or Alive. Citizen Kane's right under Dead or Alive, though. It's that, Citizen Kane. Citizen Kane. Come Citizen on, Kane Citizen. you didn't have Jamie Prisley doing volleyball. Yes. <laughs> that's why we're so in sync that's why the podcast keeps going we just, our cycles are on the same alright go, <laughs> go ahead well um, and then Oliver also actually he shared um, our page at one point on Facebook and he said uh, one of the best movie podcasts around full of fun facts and other stuff and uh, you know, we, I want to emphasize this because we usually have the call like do iTunes reviews or sure. other things like that we also would appreciate if you can if you don't want to do iTunes reviews that's fine at least Share the show around whatever social media you do. We also appreciate that. Absolutely. Anytime somebody does that. And thank you, Oliver. Yes. By the way, you've been a champion almost from like episode one. Yes. I mean, Oliver's been coming in the whole time, and I really appreciate that, Oliver. Mm-hmm. And uh, we also did just recently celebrate the start of our second year. Though it's it's kind of weird because like if you look at our listing because of how iTunes fucked up when we first started, it says like oh our first four episodes were released on June first. No, we consider May tenth. To be the anniversary. Yes. That's when we put up the first episode officially, in some regard. Um, and Mallory Somerville had this to say in reference to that, uh, at Rosemary's Bay, says, I love what you guys come up with every time. Great movie selections, great discussions, and you're not afraid to have fun with it. It's been the highlight of my week since day one, and I can't wait to see what you all have in store for this next year. I guess Adam's okay, too. Don't tell him, but I'm super proud of him. Aww. Well, thank you, Mallory, and next time I see you, I'm spitting in your coffee. <laughs> <laughs> he does that with love no but thank you Valerie I love you very much you 
ass. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's so much love all around. Um, and we also want to spread that love to some other people who uh, do great stuff with the show. Thanks to Chris Oliver for the intro and outro music used on our show. Listen to more of his music at chrisoliver.bandcamp.com. Uh, thanks to Emily Scarda for our art. Uh, she accepts commissions at 502rs.com slash eescarda. And I actually wanted to put out a recommendation for a podcast that I started listening to after I've been doing some research for this episode. I want to recommend um, it's Sam Van Heron's podcast, Can You Believe It? Uh, which I love that title. <laughs> um, and he, it's a, on TalkFilmSociety.com, and it's all over like iTunes, obviously. He goes through all of Keanu's movies in chronological order with a guest, um, and it's it's a great show. Um, he did a crossover episode recently with Sarah Sorrentino's podcast, We Forgive You, um, where they talked about 47 Ronin, actually. Ah. Yeah, so I want to recommend Ooh. that, and it's it's a really fun show. I like I dig listening to it. And of course, we want to also thank Heather, for coming on it's always a pleasure having you on yeah uh, thank you for having me and i enjoyed it <laughs> she said yeah, under protest right. <laughs> she has a gun Damn in her it. face and you can find us on twitter or facebook at dedb pod that's where we post up like i mentioned those calls for action um, we'll have our one for our next episode up as we speak here and as this is released. Um, and you can also email us uh, doubleedgedoublebill at gmail.com for any feedback you want to share. I also have my own individual account on Twitter at not the who's Tommy. I also have that on Instagram uh, for my own little musings. And I do write reviews as well at marianithomas.wordpress.com. I have a Detective Pikachu review up right now. And uh, spoilers, it's decent. So it would beat the video game movie curse, kind of. At least so far. Right. It's it's a step. It's a step. In that, like, uh-huh. oh, I tolerated this. Great. I think Sonic's going to set that step back quite a I bit. Was, I was actually going to say the opposite. I think Sonic's going to blow that out of the water. <laughs> <laughs> he lives in a gangster's paradise. You, you can't not. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> For more lovable content like that, subscribe to us on iTunes or any of the other places we're at. We're, like, on Spotify we're on Stitcher, we're on YouTube, we're on most places where you can find podcasts, and um, if you don't share us, uh, at least try and rate and review us uh, on those platforms to show uh, that you really pay attention to the show and more people can get interested if you leave such comments. Uh, so if you can, please do. Not if you can, just fucking do it, for God's sakes. Please, dear God, I live with him. <laughs> 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 she, she and his child are starving. He's fine. He eats all the time. We, we have angry dinners after he returns. <laughs> Just like us. Uh, well, um, we hope you like us enough to stay tuned for next week because uh, we have uh, in honor of Aladdin coming out. Uh, we're not doing Disney again, uh, but we decided, you know what? A big star in that movie is Will Smith, who is uh, one of our bigger stars of the last 20 years or so, and uh, he's made plenty of good and a lot of bad movies, more than most people, I think, would uh, give credit to him for. Yo, I agree. And he yeah. also has that other one coming out where it's Will Smith versus Will Smith. Gemini Man and, from Ang Lee. Yeah. Yes, I'm actually very excited about that one. Really? <laughs> Only because it's Ang Lee. Uh, okay. <laughs> I, I, I always want to see whatever the hell Ang Lee's doing. In honor of Aladdin coming out, we're doing our Will Smith movies, and uh, I had the two good movies they have assigned numbers between 1 and 10 for those, and Adam is on the same for two bad Will Smith movies. And uh, usually each of us would pick a number between 1 and 10 that would decide the good and the bad movie. When we have a guest on, like, the lovely Heather, uh, she picks a number between 1 and 10 for both those. So for my two good choices, Heather? Uh, four. All right. Yes. At number three, I have what I would consider to be the finest hour for Will Smith at all. It is the 1997 film Men in Black. I'm totally down. Nice. I, I knew that was yeah. going to be your fucking pick, too. Just I've said it so many times. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good choice. <laughs> How much I love that movie. Um, and then at number 10, I had uh, Michael Mann's Ollie, which he's quite good at. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's a great movie, but I think it is a great mm-hmm. turn from him. Yeah, he's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you sound like he broke up with you? <laughs> Whatever. It's, I don't it's know. Cool. I don't know. What are you up Look, to? Look, <laughs> if Will Smith broke up with you, you would harness that anger that is true yeah <laughs> he, have you seen that man he still looks great oh he looks fantastic yeah for sure uh but now heather for the two bad choices for grumpy old adam over there 
Let's go with number 10. At number eight, I have Focus. Uh, it was apparently made in 2016 with Will Smith and Margot Robbie. I have no idea what it's about, but it bombed. I've never seen that one either. Uh, yeah, exactly. So fuck it. We're shooting blind. And then at number two, I had iRobot because I hate that movie. <laughs> That's just another one for me where we'll talk about this next week, but it's just such a forgettable big blockbuster movie. And that's that's what he just did so much of. So have you not heard of Focus? I've heard of Focus. I just never saw oh. it. Yeah, no, me neither. Right. So I'm I just know, like, okay, it's it's uh, him and Harley Quinn team back up. That's right? like con people. I think they're con artists. I think. I think. I don't, I, 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 I don't, I don't know. know. I don't know. Watch it be something super deep. And then we're going to be talking about, I can't believe it. This is an undiscovered American classic. No one knows about it. (laughs) What the hell? What the hell? (laughs) You know what? This movie didn't fail, but you failed in America. You You failed, failed, focus. (laughs) Shit. Well, we'll find out all about that next week, but until then, guys, we got to, you know, practice for our battle of the bands, right? Right. Long live the tooch. <laughs> they get better. <laughs>